Okay. Brilliant. It will not be needed. And you need, presumably, do you need uh, screen sharing, Val? Yes, please. Okay, that's fine. Hi there. Good evening, Sam. Hi, Sam. Hi, Sam. Good evening, Karen. Hi, Karen. Hiya. Hello there. <clears throat> Hello, look. Hello, look who we've got. Isn't that splendid? How are you, Lee? You all right? Not so bad, Father. Thank you. Good to see you. That can't, that, that cannot actually, that cannot be David, can it? It is, yeah. He's growing so fast. Mm -hmm. What are you yeah. feeding him? <laughs> Not acceptable. <laughs> How splendid. Absolutely. Well, oh, no, John Bedley's. This is super irrigation. This is, no, oh, look, here's John. Um, John doesn't have to be here anymore, but here he is, you know, fulfilling his vocation as an all round good guy. We love is this like the Hotel California, Father? <laughs> <laughs> can never leave. You never <laughs> ever leave. This is it now, forever. <laughs> <laughs> now it's just a quick check. Who's here? Nineteen boxes. So one, two, three, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. <laughs> Okay. Is there anybody we know who isn't going to be able to be here tonight? Any 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 apologies of any description? No? Okay. David! How are you doing, mate? What a star. <laughs> what a lovely boy. Very holy, David. It's lovely. That's right. <laughs> what, what what is it exactly of your dad's that you're eating? I'm just <laughs> just wondering there. <laughs> I think our dogs are in trouble. I'll just go and shut the door. No, I won't. I'll leave it. Open. I will, however, mute in just a minute. Right, good evening everyone. It's very good to see you all um, once again for one of our Tuesday evenings. This evening we're being led by Father Ross, who uh, requires no introduction, um, except to say that I discovered yesterday how very popular he was when he was at college. So that's nice, isn't it? All his friends said hello, so that was lovely. So without further ado, uh, Father Ross, the floor is yours. Thank you. And I must say there were perks of being the barman whilst at Theological College, and that's probably where I made most of my friends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you all for being here. Um, we have all recently uh, celebrated Mother's Day, and so I thought, well, why not for a special treat? Let's have a session called Behold Your Mother. Oh, I think some of you would already know where we're going to go with this theme, but I thought about this after doing some reading, as I do, of the crucifixion narratives in the Gospels around this time. And after reading the Gospel of John, I was struck by these two verses in particular, which I'm going to share with you now. There we go. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. Now, 
for starters, we're going to be talking about men. And this isn't going to be a session in which I try and convert you to every Marian doctrine out there. But what I want you to do is to think about what will be said this evening. and Maybe give Mary a chance. So let's think of some of the names in which we give Mary. What's in a name? I mean, some of these are not very controversial at all. We call Mary Virgin. We call her mother. We'll call her mother of Jesus, full of grace, immaculate, ever virgin. Now we get into debates among some Christians, most holy, most pure. There might be a few discussions about that. But then what about the real crux of it all? Mother of heaven, mother of the church, and mother of God. What about this name? What about these names? Especially the last one, mother of God. Mother of God is the first and the greatest of the Marian titles out there. From the Greek theotokos, which means God bearer. Now, one thing which I must also highlight is that all the claims we make about Mary come from a basic fundamental truth about the Christian faith. And it doesn't start with Mary. It starts with Jesus and who Jesus is and the belief that Jesus is God. And if Jesus is truly a divine person, Mary, mother of Jesus, must also be the mother of God. So it would seem. But there seems to be a large number of Christians who would take umbrage with such a claim. So let's start off with that loaded question, which seems very easy to begin with, until you really start to think about it and try and answer. Who is Jesus Christ? So, let's start off the discussion. Who do you think is Jesus Christ? Can I just say something that's provocative? There was a survey of Catholics, I think, um, in America, finding out what they believed about Jesus. And, and the majority, I think 75%, said he was a good bloke. And, and uh, they, they couldn't comprehend that he was a son of God. Are we like that? I think the way you ask you ask that question, Father Ross, it, it sounds, I don't know, the way it's coming across that perhaps it's a loaded question, uh, which which is perhaps the way it's meant to be. Um, but of course, we say the creed every week, every every day, uh, yeah. and it's all inbuilt in that uh, in that in that creed, um, and. Uh, when you mentioned all those um, uh, different names for Mary, it immediately threw me back to, to Walsingham uh, when we go immediately um, from just inside the door to the Holy, Holy House, where, of course, we're reciting all those and many more, of course. Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I mean, if I uh, was to list all the names, then we'd be here all hour. Um, so, <laughs> let's try and rephrase the question, who is Jesus Christ to you and what does Jesus mean to you? Okay, Father Ross, I'll chip in. Um, I think Jesus Christ 
He's the Son of God. He's the Savior of the world. He's what I go to. He's what I everything I do. Um, I know that um, a lot of people have a problem with um, Mariological um, theology. Um, I've, there's one, um, a particular family at St Paul's that really, really struggle with it. And every time any of the um, Mary um, festivals and feasts come up, they always go, oh, it's Roman Catholic, it's Roman Catholic. Um, and um, it, it's really hard um, to explain um, where Mary sits in the whole scheme of, um, of things. But without Mary, um, the whole thing falls apart. <laughs> it, it, if you know what I mean, it's like Mary has got to be um, immaculate, has got to be um, the Theotokos, has got to be the God bearer for the whole thing to actually, um, the whole theology behind it to work. That's just, you know, what I think. Thank you. Would you also like to lead the rest of this presentation? <laughs> How about others? What, what, who is Jesus to you? What does he mean to you? Is he just a nice bloke, which Father Roger has said, or is he the son of God? Is he God? It's much more than that. St. Augustine if, ruled if, out him being a nice bloke, didn't he? Yeah. In that he said he was uh, uh, out there, out homo non bonus. Uh, either God or not a nice bloke, or not a good man, or formally. Uh, I think that's uh, that. That is, that I think is 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 what you're getting at. And this this really is the is the crucial issue about what we believe about Jesus. I mean, the allegedly controversial title of Mother of God comes from an early council, doesn't it? I'm afraid I'm not a theologian or church historian. I don't remember which one. But it, it's essentially an assertion think it's that Our totally Lady dead. is the mother of of Jesus' divinity as well as his humanity. I think this is the uh, uh, the core issue here. Well, we'll go explore a bit about that. Honest. But yes, Father Tony, you was going to say. Um, it, it's more than that. Jesus Christ is much more than that because if Christians really aren't sure about his divinity, then the whole faith falls apart. Hmm. And there were there were many arguments about this in the first five hundred years of the of the church, the Christian church. <laughs> it's probably worth saying that the, the the early councils of the church were simply, or not that simply as it turned out, the results. <laughs> The best and most developed thinking of the time and the councils are really important because otherwise we just end up reinventing the wheel all the time but that shouldn't stop us from exploring who Jesus is from our own experience and yes our understanding of the councils of the church are really important but in this context if we're going to make any headway in terms of understanding these core relationships maybe we should just start where we are and there will be a, a number of different views of this across you know we're not a, we're not a monochrome group of people and you know let's have permission to explore this and say what we really feel and experience because it's the only way we'll we'll really kind of develop our understanding of, of what are incredibly complicated things and for many people I think faith is much simpler than that and I just wanted to kind of so we didn't get too bogged down in in, in stuff we might not know very much about I'll come back since I uh, halted any discussion. And my apologies for that. I was hoping it would generate some. But I say, I, I think if we're honest with ourselves, we'll have an image of Jesus um, which helps us. 
And the simple one I suggest is friend. The fact that he's God's, God's son makes it all the more super, doesn't it? But, you know, how do we treat him when we pray to him? Might very well be as a friend. I think I'll be quiet for the rest of the evening, Father Ross. No, no. I'm not doing, I'm not doing, any, I'm, I'm not doing any good, am I? <laughs> no, I, I like that image of Jesus as friend. Um, for me, I very much see Jesus as shepherd. Um, and one who goes out and reaches for the lost sheep. Um, and there there's to rejoice at that's how I put to Jesus many a time. I think Father Roger's right. I think, for me, Jesus makes God um, kind of accessible. Um, it, it's like, um, it, it's the pathway. I don't know whether that makes sense. Jesus, Jesus yeah. shows us the human face of God. Yeah. And so we can recognise because this is one like us. Well, I think that's got your brains motoring <laughs> a bit. <laughs> and... <coughs> Jesus means different things to all of us, and there'll be things which we'll hold in common, and there'll be things which are very personal. And one of those things which we do hold in common, I believe, is that Jesus is the Son of God, and that Jesus is also God. So if that's the case, Who is Jesus Christ? Who did Mary give birth to? I want to share with you an exchange between a Catholic apologist and a non denominational minister, which went a little like this. So, Catholic apologist CA, non denominational minister ND. So you reject the doctrine of Mary as mother of God. Absolutely, God has no mother. Well, let me ask you this question. Is Jesus God? Absolutely, he is 100% God and 100% man. Okay, good. Let me ask you another question. Was he God when he was a little boy? Absolutely. Good, we agree. Was he God when Mary was six months pregnant? Yes, he was God from the moment of his conception. Was he God when he was coming out of the womb of Mary at his birth? He responded a little slower and softer at this point. But after a brief pause, he said, yes, he was God then too. Was Mary then the mother of God? Then there was an emphatic, no, he is not the mother of God. She is the mother of the man, Jesus Christ. Now, this sort of claim has been founded in a lot of anti-Catholic bias. It's built up over many, many years. But I believe that rejecting Mary as the theotokos, as the God-bearer, leads to a very distorted understanding of who we believe Jesus is. And I want to propose two problems and consequences of this. Firstly, there is a denial of the divinity of Christ. So that first thing, that's basically saying Mary gives birth to a mere human being and that Jesus is not God at all. Now, that was something which was discussed in early councils and it's called Arianism, which is a heresy. In modern day speak, we'll be setting up a hashtag cancel party Arius for coming up with certain claims. And it's also important to note that at least a non-denominational non minister didn't fall into this trap. So there is a saving grace. 
that, to, that neither divinity of Christ is a hashtag cancel party for him. But the second claim, creation of two persons, one human and one divine. Here we're facing something called Nestorianism. Here we get a rejection of the unity of the human and the vine. It's basically saying Jesus has multiple personalities, where the dialogue would be, hi, human Jesus, how are you today? I'm just hanging the vine Jesus. Now, the biblical position teaches that Jesus is one person to whom there are two natures. And it's not a 50% of or 50% of the other. Jesus is 100% human and 100% divine. So this is known in its technical language as a hypostatic union, and it's from the Chalcedian crew uh, to answer the question from earlier on. So it's the dual nature of Christ being both completely human and completely God. Not entering into Good Friday very soon. And if we suggest that Jesus is not fully God and fully man, then where does that leave us? Now, if Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that he isn't truly God. Show of hands, do we show, do we fall into uh, a pit? Is there a stumbling point? If Jesus is not God and he dies for our sins. Show our hands if you think that might be the case. This union of God being human and divine completely. That is how we properly understand who Christ is as a person. And to all believers, we must appreciate him as being this, both fully God and fully man. As both God and man, he alone is our saviour, mediator, priest, and king. And maybe those are other things which people may have thought about when I asked, who is Jesus Christ? Um, in our kind of we celebrate Christ as the king, for example, Christ as the king, Christ as the high priest, Christ as the sacrificial lamb. It is necessary for Jesus to voluntarily come into the flesh. Word became flesh, fill the will of his father, that being the redemption and reconciliation of humanity to God through the work of the cross. Unless Jesus was fully God and fully man, this act of redemption would have been incomplete. Though I argue it's important that we don't fall into the trap in saying Jesus is two separate people. But then we go back to Mary in all of this. By denying Mary as being the mother of God, we also fall into the trap of saying Jesus is not fully God and fully man. But let's be careful when I say Mary is the mother of God. I'm not saying Mary is the mother of the Trinity. Nor are we saying that Mary is the mother of the Father. Nor is Mary the mother of the Holy Spirit. When we say mother of God, we mean Mary is the mother of the second person of the Trinity. And because the Trinity is undivided, therefore we still say mother of God, so long as by that we mean the word made flesh and other, not the other two persons. As one friend has put it, Mary is daughter of the Father, mother of the Son, spouse of the Spirit. I quite like like that definition. But let's get on to our original topic, Behold Your Mother, and the words which Jesus spoke on the cross. We go back to this passage of scripture. 
from John 19. I'm going to ask you two questions. Um, and we'll, we'll see where the debate takes us there. Are we comfortable calling God our father? And are we comfortable calling God our mother? Mary, our mother. Let's start off with the first question. Are we comfortable calling God our father? A lot of nodding of heads there. Um, does anyone want to give more, more than a shake, a nod of the head? I'm comfortable with it because when the apostles asked Jesus to teach them to pray, he thought about it and could not come up with a better construction than the notion of God as our Father. And it, it's good enough for Jesus. It's good enough for me. So we get it in the Lord's Prayer, the prayer which a lot of us have been taught as a child, or to uh, learn, read, write, meditate. Or are other people's thoughts on that? Sorry, could you repeat that, uh, Father? The sound's breaking up uh, a little bit. Uh, sorry. Um, are we comfortable calling God our Father? Yes, we've said we've said, we've yes, said yes to yes that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Did you say something beyond that? Yeah, we're going to get onto that in a, in a couple of minutes. So. I think I'd like to add, um, I'm comfortable certainly with calling God Father, but I can also appreciate it when people aren't. But I yeah. don't think that's due to their relationship with God, that's due to a relationship with what Father means to them. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what Father is meant to be, I'm certainly comfortable with God being that to me, but I can appreciate when people find that a very difficult term to use yeah uh, so when you think of the word abba and the closeness of that if they haven't had that closeness with their own father figures in their lives then that can become problematic <clears throat> I think. or indeed Otherwise, or indeed have been in an abusive relationship with their own father yeah uh, fatherhood father then becomes a problematic term for people in that situation and it, it you're quite right john it's something we have to remember mm. that it isn't the idyllic relationship for everybody that that, that jesus use of the term implies mm. thank you for sharing that mm. i think there is a sense of beauty and mystery that we're able to call God Father in that intimate way of Abba, which essentially means Daddy. Um, because by that, we, we have that knowledge that we are God's children. And we're precious in his sight. And I think that's a very beautiful image to always keep hold on. What about calling Mary our mother? Is that a question we might not have even thought of before? What are people's thoughts about that? Mm -hmm. 
I don't have a problem with it. Um, but if I think, I don't have a problem with it because I'm used to using it. Um, I think if it hit me for the first time, um, <coughs> perhaps think about it more then than perhaps I do now, uh, because it would be a new expression um, and it wouldn't necessarily have the inclusive feel about it that it does now being, as I say, part of, um, of where I am with um, my relationship with God and, and Mary. That's, that's definitely an experience I share. I think that the first time that question was struck me, uh, took several steps back and really had to analyze what was going on here. Um, yeah, it definitely took me, me by surprise. What are other people's? I think it's really difficult uh, in a group like this to be brave enough to express a contrary view. Yeah. <laughs> and as I look around the screen, I see people whose whose Christian upbringing uh, is different from my own, and sometimes it's really hard to live that or to express that if we feel that um if we feel that that's going to run contrary to the to the general current of the conversation i had a i had a period of my life when this whole thing seemed to me to be arrant nonsense and i i fought against what i think had been the faith of my parents uh, and it was only later on in life that it started to make sense to me again, and that it, it became a a worldview, if you will, that that, that that worked. And so I ascribed the label truth to it. But it's absolutely okay to wrestle with this stuff and to wrestle with it, you know, certainty is the enemy of faith. And, you know, it's, it's absolutely fine to say, well, I'm, I'm not there yet. I'm not, I, I can't do what you're suggesting because it's same, I'm not wired that way. My background or whoever's background could have been in a place where this sort of stuff was just not on the table. And, you know, that's okay. And, you know, it's stuff that some people find really difficult. And, and I, I don't say that for myself now, but it took a while. And it was only really when I went to seminary that it started to make any sort of sense again. Yeah. Um, I think, Father Damien, a lot of people find it more difficult to think of Mary as a mother than God as Father. Yeah. Much I'd more agree, difficult. I'd agree with that. Much, much more difficult. And when you move amongst people who are believers, who are good people, their argument against that is almost as convincing as their argument for. And I think it becomes really, really difficult. Because we do, we've taught the Lord's Prayer. So there, our Father to us is very familiar. Words of Jesus recorded in the Bible, yeah. Not a, but, it's very yeah. familiar. Yeah. When it comes to Mary, 
as mother, then people outside of this sort of community mm. very often feel that, well, obviously you must be a Roman Catholic. Mm. I've had it said to me time and time and time again. Because there's a, it seems to be a separate feeling. I don't know why, but it does. I, I perfectly agree there, yes. <coughs> can, I, can I just pick up, when you say a separate feeling... Yeah, amongst people. Right. In, in, what, in what sense? Can I think, you... I think it's the feeling of you you belong to a Roman Catholic. This is what they feel. You belong... Right. Well, that's what they do. We don't uh, do that. Yeah, is it? Is it? There's a separation yeah. between there's the Roman a Catholics separate, and the rest. A real separation between the two. And a real, it's far more difficult to, on the, to call God Father, to be happy with calling God Father, rather than Mary Mother. I think it's because we, we also have our Father in yes, the Bible. I'm sure it is. And I'm absolutely sure. Yeah. The Lord's Prayer is universal. That is what we say. That's fine. And people can live with that. When it comes to Mary as mother, many, many people can't. I think one, one thing that people need to think about is the fact that Mary was an extraordinary human being. Yeah. Um, and I'm certain she wasn't conscious that she was going to be the mother of God when she was growing up as a girl and then as a young woman. And then we got a one wonderful story of the Annunciation and her response to it. And uh, that, for me, makes that story so wonderful that God chooses to work through human beings I think the other thing we need to say as well is that we've got a problem with language. Yeah. We're trying to deal, talk, talk about God. And in order to do that, we need words. And the best I think that uh, we, we can say is that we're using words in a spiritual way in order to help us understand. And it's so difficult um, to uh, actually think, um, well, do I worry whether I'm orthodox or not? In other words, um, do, do, do I believe everything that uh, uh, Christians say about Jesus or God or Mary or not? Um, and I think the important thing to remember is that St. Thomas Aquinas gave up lecturing the on theology because he found God so much more interesting <laughs> than his own words. <laughs> so we, we, I, I, I think um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll find our place for Mary ourselves. Yeah. But I, I, I think the, the other thing to remember is that um, I would say, remember in heaven, sitting with God, the Father, Son, and Spirit, is a human being. And I think that's why people think, well, there are times when I feel much more comfortable talking to Mary, and I can call her mum, than I can either talking to Jesus or the Holy Spirit or God, the Father. And I find that a great comfort. I think, well, when I'm lost for words, well, come on, mother, you can help me. You know what I want to say. You can do it better than I can. And that's not high theology. No, that's a human being talking mm. in a very human way. It also plays in part with our own human relations as well. Mm. Who, who, who do we speak to most? I think that the massive factor. 
I think it's very important that we don't reduce <clears throat> um, matters of faith to a series of propositions. Mm. Um, our faith is fundamentally about a, a, a core relationship with Jesus Christ. And everything flows from that. And yes, as, as I said earlier, you know, the, the wisdom of the first 500 years after Jesus was trying to answer precisely that question, who is Jesus Christ? And it was 451, the Council of Chalcedon came up with this definition of someone with two natures, which coexist in the same in the same person and i mean if that doesn't kind of blow your mind I, i'm not sure what does because the idea that one could possess more than one nature one could be human and be divine at the same time is terrifying until you realize that the whole point of jesus coming to earth at all is so that we can become divine ourselves. He doesn't just come so that we can get to heaven, although that's a nice thought. He doesn't just come so that he can forgive us our sins, although that's a nice thought. It's far more scandalous than that. He comes so that we might become as he is, so that we might live in the divine nature as distinct from our own given human nature. And that is, that, that's the bit that blows the top of my head off when I'm praying, that, that God might have those designs for me, that God might want me to be like he is. I mean, that just is outrageous. I know me, you see, and it's really outrageous. Want you to live to your full potential. Yeah, but even beyond that, you're, you're absolutely right. But even beyond that, I've got we've got potential we don't even know about. Oh, and God it's the God-givenness, it's the it's grace, it's stuff we've done nothing to deserve. And God is saying, you can have this life, you can have this. You can be divine, share in my actual nature, rather than just being content with being human. And that's that's where that's where we're on a journey to, all of us. And you know that's that's the crux of this, and that we we crucified this. We execute this, this incredible God-man, God-human. And he rose from the dead. He was raised from the dead. For me, that's where Mary's mother fits in, in that she wants us to live that life. And I always her as this slightly sort of matriarchal, Jewish mama, mm. the wedding of Cana of Galilee, do whatever he tells you. She's yeah. constantly, in all of that imagery of our lady, she's pointing to Jesus. She's pointing us to that life, that resurrection life, that crucifixion that she stood by, that resurrection that she witnessed. She's desperate for us to have that life as any mother wants her, any child to have that fullness of life. And that's where I see Mary's mother following on from Daniel. As if you've been reading my notes, because... Um... <laughs> <laughs> we've oh God, we've been we blowing the cover, Father. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. We... <laughs> no. The wedding feast of Cana. Milton Jones. Uh, a comedian famous for his one-liners, wrote a book called Ten Second Sermons. It's absolutely wonderful. And there is a mention um, in one of the sermons 
under weddings about the wedding feast of Cana. And the sermon goes like this. Jesus was a guest at Cana, although the number of times this is mentioned at weddings, he might be regretting it now. <laughs> So let's look at this passage in a bit more depth. Here we have Mary as the new Eve and Jesus as the new Adam. So here we start off with the words on the third day. But John, being the great theologian he was, this is the seventh day in Seventh, uh, seventh set-apart day in uh, his gospel narrative. We have four separate days covered in John 1, which starts off with the words in the beginning. So we're getting uh, all those creation narratives coming in. And then the third, of the third day, so we've got four plus three, we've got seven days linking in with the seven days of creation. So on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there, there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. They took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. <laughs> but you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. I'll just let you ponder that first for a little while. In this, Jesus refers to his mother as woman. And this is a reference to Mary as the prophetic woman of Genesis 3.15 and Jeremiah 31.22. And it's through Mary's intercession Jesus performs this first miracle, his first sign. The new Eve is, is integral to the work of the new Adam. Through Mary's intercession, the disciples believed in Jesus. Therefore, Mary does not only give birth to Jesus' ministry to make all things new, but also gives birth to the faith of the disciples. We see more of that fulfillment of prophecy with the sick stone jars, or the purification waters of the old covenant, turning into the symbolic wine of the new covenant. There is no separation of Mary from the inauguration of Christ's ministry to the completion on the cross where Mary is at his feet. The sword pierced her heart, and through their suffering, many were saved. As Father Adam has also pointed out, we hear those words, do whatever he tells you. And surprisingly, those are the last words we hear Mary speak in the entirety of John's Gospel. Nowhere else do we hear Mary speak. So what do these final words of Mary say? She points us, to her son, not to herself, but to the one who saves. So we all should follow Mary as an example as the one who points to Jesus. Mary is not God, as Richard Dawkins has recently published in a recent book, but she plays a part 
in our salvation. She wasn't the one who died for our sins. But through her sufferings at the foot of the cross, she kept in keeping with the divine plan. And Christ offers his mother to us all. Mary points us not to her, but to her son, becoming the spiritual mother of all who keep the commandments of God and keep the testimony of Jesus as we read in the book of Revelation. I firmly believe, going back to those two passages of scripture, which I've really been meditating on. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. I firmly believe that in this act, Jesus does not just give his mother to the beloved disciple. But he presents Mary to be the mother of all believers. Therefore, Mary, well, behold your mother, is therefore a cry to all of us. So as we draw nearer to the events of the crucifixion and resurrection, Remember Mary, remember her part in the salvific work. And I pray that all of you will take to heart the words of Christ on the cross. Delve deeper into this topic because there's a lot I haven't covered. Uh, maybe we'll cover it at another Building Faith session, but there's far too much to talk about in just an hour. Um, you, you can write books on all of this, in fact, people have. Um, but delve deeper into this and dare to embrace Mary as your own mother. That's me done. <laughs> And all under the hour as well. <laughs> An example to the kids. It's definitely a, a difficult topic to, um, to delve straight into, especially if this is your first time really thinking about it. Um, I remember when I was first introduced to Anglo Catholicism, um, we had a, a service of Conklin with an address. And the address was simply give Mary a chance. And um, it took me many, many years to really ponder on this before I could say, to my, say for myself, Mary is my mother. So we were all at different points of the journey. Um, but do delve into it. Uh, there's a lot of solid stuff and uh, it definitely spurs you on. Um, and I hope it, it forms as part of your own faith. Don't be frightened to have the conversation from the heart. You know, if, if one of you were to come up to me and say, I just don't get it. Then that begins, I hope, a fruitful conversation in which we each seek to understand the other. And that's how we all grow. And it's not a question of fitting into a prescribed, you know, preset box of belief. It's about lived experience. And so don't be frightened. I mean, look at the creed. <laughs> it contains propositions about God and of the nature of God, which are absolutely out there and off the scale. And yet we say or sing it every week. There must be things about 
the creed that all of us have difficulty with. And that's okay, that's part of the journey, that's part of the struggle, as Father Ross said. But don't be frightened to talk about it. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean that you are in any way defective or a second class Christian, far from it, because you're actually trying to grapple with the thing. You're trying to get to grips with it. And that's rather than just sort of saying, well, or, you know, consign that to the too difficult pile and move on. Yeah, give give this stuff a chance, but also don't be frightened to say, no, I'm nowhere with this. Because that's actually when the fruitful stuff starts. Yes, I, I, I think another point about the creeds is this, as you said, Father Damien, they contain propositions, statements, yeah. statements of faith. They don't give explanations. No. And there's a very good reason for that. Mm. And that is that the creeds were used as a, as, as a means of measuring orthodoxy. Yeah. Uh, uh, and and uh, it's still against those measures of orthodoxy that uh, we judge what other people are saying. So when we get an explanation about uh, the, the, the divinity of Christ, for instance, yeah. we measure it against what the creeds have said or stated. Indeed. Uh, uh, and uh, that's extremely helpful because I think it gives us the opportunity to say, well, we can attempt to explain God to others, but be warned. We need to say, well, this is in my experience. Well, that was supposed to get a, a, a not a rousing applause, but <laughs> everybody else would start talking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I could say, Father Ross, I, th I thoroughly enjoyed this because it brings back memories of uh, uh, struggling with the Greek texts. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> wow. Well, some of us, some of us enjoyed our Greek them. texts more than others, Father. I <laughs> I didn't or <laughs> ever but there we are okay um, anything else anybody else wants to say before before we all breathe out and there was silence in heaven for about half an hour <laughs> The dog's after my dinner plate. I'm sorry about it. He's here, look. <laughs> <laughs> Say hello to everybody. No, you're not really interested, are you? What does Theotokos mean to you? Hmm? I don't know. Okay. Father Ross, thank yeah. you. It's it, you it, it's a complex oh, old you, it's a complex old bit of stuff and and I think you've 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 led us through it with great gentleness and sensitivity, and it, it's stuff that we will. It's it's the gate we need. It's gates we need to pass through if we're if we're going to grow in faith. And the understanding of that core question of who Jesus is, and every, you're quite right. Everything flows from that from that fundamental question. When I started seminary, we was given three questions to think about. And the first one, you've heard that sermon many a time. Several times. Every yeah. day we have to ponder, who is Jesus Christ? Who is Jesus Christ? It's the... And it's, it's a daily struggle. Yeah, do, you, do you think that question is not asked enough in my generation, in the younger generation? Perhaps, perhaps if you ask it, others will too. Mm. So those, and the fact that you bless you the fact that you're you're here and and you're 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 in with this stuff and you're 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 grappling with it shows that it can be done and therefore you know massive credit for, for that and who knows you know if you're having conversations like that then why can't other people age isn't a Age isn't a barrier on this one. We just, I mean, it's just not part of the currency, I suspect. I don't 
think it's so much the, the, the age. I think it's um, just just the way we go to society now. Yeah, you know yeah, I mean? and 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 this yeah. is this is for many people. This isn't the way people are brought up, and so we have to find ways of of making those connections with and for people. That's what we're here to do. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's easy. Um, but no, no, it's very hard. I mean, I, I struggle. <laughs> well, we just not not with myself. I, I, I'm, sure, it's, uh, it's it's other people. So well, yeah, I mean, but but you know, you've joined a band of strugglers, and we're all you know we whether we whether we admit that or not, all mm -hmm. of us you know we are we are fellow strugglers on the same journey. And none of us have cracked this yet. You know, however long we've been at it or however many books we've read or any of that stuff, all of us are, are engaged in, Father Ross was absolutely right, every day, every day of our lives, these questions raise their head for us because that's what ultimately gives it all meaning. And that's how we, how we make sense of the world. Yeah. And so, long live the struggle, I say, because that's how we grow. Yes. Uh, 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 can I say one final thing? Because uh, I, I'd hate to think people are left in court crumbs. That, 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 that was too hard. It's done my brain in. Um, there's some things attributed to Martin Luther. And he said, what's the longest journey that a person makes in their lives? And the answer is, from the head to the heart. Mm. And if you've got God in your heart, don't worry so much about your heads. Spot on. Spot on. Mm. And with that... Can I just say something? Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was just going to say that when I was a little girl and I started to go to church, I was about five. So mm. I very I used to go all, all the time, but it was a, a what we call a low church. Yeah. Ordinary. And um, I carried on until I'd met Peter, well, went out with Peter in, in the 60s. And with, then I went to his church, which was an Anglo Catholic church, which I liked in a different way. I sort of began to. Linda. But really, up until, um, oh, and following on from then, going to Walsingham, you know, it just became really l love Mary, etc. But until then, when I was little, most people in my church would know Mary was the mother of Jesus, but wouldn't really think about her until it, it was the nativity scenes on the Christmas cards. Yeah. The only time people would remember who yeah. Mary was was it's just uh, different uh, levels isn't it well it's it's it, yeah it's different understandings and when we're brought up with a particular understanding that's the place we start from when we're having these conversations uh and but but, but the important thing is is the journey the important thing is the struggle and to know that you're kind of struggling with friends who who, who don't mind what you say actually yeah. and that's why we're given one another to be to, to be encouragement and comfort and consolation and the occasional challenge along the way and that's why these evenings are I, I love them for that reason because I'm a I'm a fellow struggler we all are but at some level um, it is not easy to live a life of faith, but we keep trying, we keep coming back for more, and every day is a new start, and that's, that's a great and God-given miracle. Anyway, Fitz is very keen that I now go and throw a ball for him, despite the fact yeah. that he's pitched up. <laughs> he's had enough of all of this journey of faith stuff and you really want me to come and play with you don't you so tune in next week i shall send out the invitations in slightly better time maybe than today and um 
I look forward to being being able to announce what next week's little surprise is. It's all going to be wonderful. And it's the Tuesday before Palm Sunday, before Holy Week begins. So, do you mind? Chewing. <laughs> so before, before I before I actually throttle the dog, I will I will. I will so thank you again, Father Ross. Thank you, everyone. And uh, if I don't see you before, I look forward to seeing you all next week. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.